recorded too. Yeah, I'm being recorded. Yeah. All right. I'm being recorded. I feel like I'm in the courtroom now. In the courtroom here. Okay, thank you, Brother Paul, again for uh, inviting me. That strap short. Anyway, uh, again, it's our joy to be here. Uh, of course, I've been to Australia so many times I can't count it. And uh, Ted, he's, uh, it's his first time. But uh, anyway, uh, my first brother passed away back in 2002, and it's the only one I got left. He's the good one and the bad one. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Brother Paul asked me if I'd uh, sing a couple of songs, and so uh, there are singers, and then there's singers, and uh, the old boy from Mount Bush, you know, in the back, well, he's a, he's a singer more than he is a singer. I don't know if it's in my key or not, but let's give it a try. Here's a song entitled, uh, I Remember the Day. Remember what? Remember that Jesus loves me. He loves me. I remember the day Jesus took my sins away And he made a brand new man out of me I knelt down at the altar with the burden on my heart When I got up, a man had been set free Oh, he loves me, yes, he loves me And I know that he loves me and he saved me, yes he saved me, and I know he'll do the same for you. Dear friends, lay your burdens at the foot of the cross, and try to do your best to live for him. When you reach those pearly gates, he will take you by the hand, saying, my good and faithful servant, enter in. Oh, he loves me, yes, he loves me, and I know that he loves you too. And he saved me, yes, he saved me, and I know he'll do the same for you. Yes, I know he'll do the same for you. Amen. Yeah, and he loves me. I'm so glad he does. Uh, sometimes I wonder if anybody loves me. But, uh, you know, some days you have good days, some days you have bad days, and it seems like the whole world turns on you some days. But I'm glad he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He made us. He created us. And um, we're not created. I mean, we're not where we need to be for most of us. We're certainly not what he wants us to be, but we're working on it. Amen? When you get saved by the grace of God, that's called justification. You're being justified in Christ, being made brand new in the Lord, and you become a new creation or a new creature in Christ Jesus. But uh, then uh, comes sanctification, and sanctification is a process. Just when you get saved, you, you don't have a clue what you're doing and what you need to do or anything else, but as you grow in the Lord, it's called uh, sanctification. You're being sanctified in the Lord, and so I'm glad that when I started out, just a little brown-haired, freckle-faced, barefooted boy walking the bayous of South Louisiana, uh, when I got saved, uh, I'm glad that I can say that I've come a long ways, come a long ways in the Lord, and I'm glad that He loves me, and um, uh, I'm, I'm glad that he, he loves all of us. He didn't always like us. He don't always like me. He loves me, but He doesn't like me sometimes because I don't do what He tells me to do. And uh, you're chuckling, but you're not any different. Amen. <laughs> all right. Uh, here's a song that... Uh, that we, Here's a song that uh, my first wife, she was killed in a, road, in a road accident in Fiji back in 2002. And we used to sing all over the world. And so now it's just me. And, uh, but here's a song that we used to sing. It's about heaven. Now, I don't know whether you're saved today or not, whether you've been uh, born again, you've trusted Christ as your Savior today. 
But if not, I want you to know that that's what it's all about. Time's running out. Uh, we're closer to the coming of the Lord than we were when we first got here this morning. We don't have long till Jesus comes. And without Christ, the Bible is very clear. There's two destinations. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And uh, I tell you, whenever I was 13 years old, I realized for the first time of my spiritual condition, and that was that I was lost and uh, doomed and damned and needed a Savior. And uh, didn't understand it all, but after another nine months of, un of listening to the Word of God and the Spirit of the Lord deep with my heart, showed me I was lost and uh, that I needed a Savior, and so I'm so glad that He saved me. Here's a song entitled Heaven. Since childhood I heard of a heaven, I wondered if it could be true. That there were bright mansions eternal And a mansion is built there for you I found different people really go there Till one day sweet Jesus came in And I caught a vision of glory My soul with all heaven did bling Traveling on heaven eternal, heaven supernal, and oh, I'm so glad that it's real. Someday heaven's gates will swing open, the redeemed of all ages shall see the throne sending bright rays of glory on a mansion is still there for me. Heaven, happy home above, heaven eternal, and oh, it makes me feel like traveling on. Heaven eternal, heaven supernal, and I'm so glad that it's real. You said I'm old, you I'm so glad that it's There you go, Brother Paul. <laughs> you lost it. You had a good time. Yeah. You said, am I going to say? That's right. That's what you said. Yeah. That's well, you got a good time. What I'm talking about, so you don't blame it on Brother Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but don't forget, oh, he loves you. Oh, he loves you. And I know that he loves me too. Yeah, don't forget. And he'll save you. Oh, he'll save you. And I know, hey, yes, he will. You just call on him. Amen. Amen. All right, let me ask you to get these some things out of the way. Uh, turn with me, if you will, uh, this morning. I want to go back to the book of Luke. And uh, Brother Paul's not, he's not kidding. I mean, hey. If I understand the word of God, I mean, it is to be believed and it is to be preached and it is to be followed and obeyed. Now, Genesis through the last chapter of uh, Revelation chapter 22. And so uh, Brother Paul was trying to be kind, apologize for me, but uh, that don't work, amen? That don't work for me. He thinks he's going to tone me down, but it's not. But anyway, if you have your Bible this morning, let's look um, uh, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, Sunday school uh, uh, teaching session was in Luke chapter 7. We're in Luke chapter 12, and uh, we're going to um, begin reading in verse 16. Luke chapter 12, you'll stand to your feet for the reading of his word. All right. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he th thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This what I do. I will pull down my barns and uh, build greater, and, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. 
Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thou sh uh, soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Let's bow for prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you and your son, Holy Spirit, the three of you formed man and put us on the face of this earth. And uh, that's been going on through process for many, many years. And the world population today is about eight and a half billion, they reckon. But we're thankful for our own lives. Uh, thank you that you have uh, been gracious enough for those ahead of us, before us, uh, to get, bring the gospel and preach the gospel. And thankful that we had an opportunity as Gentiles to be saved by the grace of God. Again this day, for the, uh, the ministry here uh, in the early years of beginning at Heritage, we are grateful for those that are visiting today that's never come before. May they feel welcome. And uh, Lord, for all of us, may we listen, may we heed the word of God. May the word of God have free course this morning. May we be clear and uh, objective and give our best as the preacher of the hour. And may you use us, bless the word. We ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Uh, we've read about a, a man here that was a very wealthy man, according to what we've read here. He certainly wasn't uh, poor, uh, poor by any means. And... Uh, According to uh, verse 16, it says that he was rich. And so to me, that means he had, had more than just a few hundred thousand dollars. The fellow was uh, worth a, a lot, apparently. But um, then uh, it goes on to say that uh, he thought within himself, uh, what was he going to do? He had plenty and he had more than plenty and didn't even have a place to put it. But uh, anyway, in starting as an introduction this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of four kinds of people that God himself calls a fool. When I grew up, I didn't know that was in the Bible, that we were not to call people fools. Matter of fact, uh, I was thinking about it this morning over here in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I believe it is, in verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. We see a lot of that today where brothers and sisters are fighting among themselves and uh, children fighting their parents and parents fighting their children, family fighting each other. Uh, when it says uh, his brothers, not just brother, it'd be the whole family members, but it says, and whosoever shall say to his brother or his sister or mom, dad, or whoever, raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. If we're not careful, in all of our uh, different cultures, we, we have words that we use that sometimes we mouth off, we get angry with somebody. And uh, calling a person a fool is not a normal thing, but sometimes we'll say, you idiot, you idiot. If you want to translate that, that's basically saying you're saying that person's a fool. So um, let me say in the beginning, we have some older people on the front that want us to speak loudly. Uh, we're normally on a tone about like right now, but Brother John wants to be able to hear and she wants to be able to hear. She's got a cane up here and I don't want her whacking me. But anyway, if I'm a bit loud, move to the back, whatever. But um, anyway, when you look at this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, God threw out his word in the New Testament, especially in Matthew here and Luke. I mean, we're really not to call anybody a jerk or an idiot or a fool. A uh, fool is, uh, you know, call somebody stupid. Now, that's not really a fool. Uh, but anyway, uh, in our scripture reading here in Matthew 5, 22, and then over here in Luke, we find that uh, we're not really supposed to call anybody a fool. But if you'll notice in our text, God jumps out there in the lead and he does call people fools. Now, he's God, and God can do whatever he wants to do, okay? And he doesn't cut anybody slack. 
Brother Paul thinks I'm supposed to cut some slack. I'm not cutting any either. Amen. The Lord calls him a fool. I'm not, call, I'm not helping him out. But uh, the Bible does say that we are not to call anyone a fool. So uh, this morning, four kinds of people that God himself uh, calls a fool. And I, I, I know a lot of times we are foolish. Every one of us have uh, experiences of, in times in our life of things that we step out and do or uh, take action or maybe just a thought rather than a deed. But we're foolish, and uh, we, we, we ought not want to be that way. But God uh, calls four people in the Scripture, uh, as I've read through and studied and looked. But uh, there's a lot of people, I think, that's probably on that line of being foolish many times. But it doesn't give me a right to jump on them and call them a fool. But God does. And so I want to uh, just basically mention those this morning. Again, if you're not here, I mean, if you're here and you're not saved, you've never been saved by the grace of God, now listen carefully. And if you are, thank God you are. Amen. And realize that you're going to be dealing with people you have been, and tomorrow if you live, and the next week you live, you're going to be dealing with other people that certainly are living their life foolishly. And so think about this. First of all, I want to mention that those that uh, deny the existence of God uh, God basically, without uh, measure, without any restraint, uh, he calls them a fool in the scripture. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 14 and verse 1, uh, the Bible says, Thy fool, thy fool, say, uh, thy fool says, there is no God. That's Psalm 14 and 1. He says that the fool says that there is no God. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever had anyone to tell you that they do not believe that there is a God. I've had a number of people. Uh, I wouldn't want to say how many, but I'm telling you it's far more than 12 or 15. I've had a number of people in my ministry. I say my ministry is the Lord's ministry, but the ministry that God's put me in, I've had how many people literally as I witness to them say, no need to come in my way. I don't even believe there is a God. I, 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 I. But let me say to you that uh, the scriptures, uh, uh, I mean, the scripture lets us know quickly that God says that if you uh, deny his very existence, that you are a fool. Again, I don't have the right to call you that, but God in his very word lets you know that uh, you not only foolish, you're literally a fool. So, uh, uh, verse 19 is in Romans 1, 19, very clearly shows that God is real. He's very real. And uh, we find that uh, your own very own conscience in your mind. I mean, in New Guinea, I went over to New Guinea many years ago, or in Papua New Guinea, 44 years ago now. And we got there. There's seven, uh, 790 different languages and dialects. We learned the national trade language. If I was speaking to them today, I'd say, all I say, that's not bad if you eat it with a spoon or suck it with a straw. It moves right along quite quickly. But as I began to get into their lives and witness to them, uh, many of them were into sun gods and worship stones and worship birds and all types of things. But even in that, as we talked to them and witnessed to them over the years, many of them came to me and said, you know, even before we realized that there was, uh, there was uh, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, we knew within our own conscience and our own mind and heart that there was a higher power, there was a higher being. That's why our forefathers would bow. They still in their home, in, in their hearts, though they didn't understand God and didn't know anything about salvation in God's Son, they still knew that God existed. And so that's, I mean, God puts it in, 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 I mean, clear for all of us. Our conscience lets us know that God is there. Uh, you look all around creation and you see this, this didn't e evolve, ladies and gentlemen. The creation of Almighty God declares in Romans chapter 1 and 20 that he uh, created it all. This is all developed by God. Again, uh, God didn't build this building. Uh, he let mankind build it, but everything that we have comes from God Almighty. And uh, then again, we find that, uh, that uh, God lets us know without a doubt in his, in his word, his word declares that, uh, that he is God and that uh, he sent his son down here to die for our sins. We were sinners born because of the nature of uh, Adam and Eve. We go back to Romans 5 and 12. That sin passed upon all of us, whether we like it or not. I felt like, I mean, I was 13 years old when I realized that I was lost without Christ. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I got upset. That's, I mean, that's just me. I mean, I'm me, I'm me, I, I'm who I am. But I mean, I was just a 12-year-old boy, but I got upset about that thing. I went back home and I told my mom, I said, you're not going to believe what they're teaching up at the church. And she said, what is that? I said, Mama, they said that in the very beginning, God made a woman and a man, Adam and Eve, 
and he gave them only one restriction. He put them in the Garden of Eden. They were to till it, take care of it, look, at, you know, look after the garden, eat it and whatever, and uh, enjoy life. And, uh, but they were not to eat of one particular fruit of the tree of good knowledge and evil. And I said, Mom, they said if the day that, God said the day that they did was the day that they would begin to die. And uh, not only die physically now, but spiritually. And I didn't know how to explain all that to mom, but I just knew one thing. I got Romans 5.12. I, I couldn't quote it and all, but what, if I understood Romans 5.12, they were saying that because of what that man and woman did many, 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 many years before I come along, because they did it, now we're guilty of the same thing. And I said, Mom, that's the way Dad works. My mom said, what do you mean it's the way your dad works? I said, Mom, you know that's the way it is. Something go missing, something get broke, whatever. Daddy said, all right, who broke that? Hey, who moved that? Hey, who took that? Who that? You know, and in unison, you know, in unison, all four of us, Dennis, the oldest, myself, and Ted, my little sister, all of us. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I'm saying, Brother John? Yeah. Mm. No, I mean, you talk about dumb as a box of rocks. Nobody knows nothing. Somebody's guilty, but nobody's speaking. And I said, but mom, you know, dad, he'd get a peach limb or something, a belt and strap us good back then. And uh, I mean, he'd strap us all. Just, he didn't know which one did it, so he'd just strap us all. Ted got whooping because uh, I wasn't honest, you know, and I hate that. But Ted got, uh, we got whooping because Ted wasn't honest, you know, it's just so we passed it around, you know. And, uh, but I said, mom, we're not talking about getting a, excuse me, uh, getting a butt whipping. <laughs> we're not talking about a strapping. Mom, what we're talking about is, they said there's a, a, a hell, and then there's a lake of fire, and if you leave this world without the Lord, you're going to perish in this fire, and your soul's going to burn forever and ever. I didn't even know what a soul was. I'm not sure if I know what a soul is today. I've never seen one. But I know within the inner being of my heart, my life, I have a soul. And, uh, but I didn't understand that at all like when I was uh, 13 years old. But when I told my mom this, mom said, yep, that's right, son. I said, you too? Mom, come on, you don't believe that too, do you? And I said, Mom, it ain't it isn't fair because of what Adam and Eve did. That man many thousands of years ago, a woman, now, and I'm guilty of the same thing? That's a raw deal. She said, it might be a raw deal, son. But when God saw the whole picture, uh, him and his son and the Holy Spirit worked out a plan of salvation by sending his son, the Lord Jesus, to come down here and die on the cross and shed his blood that you might be forgiven of that problem which is known as sin in your life well i certainly didn't understand it all but i and even when i got saved by the grace of god i'd never taken a study course on john three sixteen or anything else hadn't gone to bible college at 13 years old but i'm telling you one thing i'd understood enough of the word of god and the spirit of the lord the holy spirit of god had begun to deal with my heart i had received the word i knew where i was at didn't fully understand it and when i bowed on my face before the lord i told him i don't understand all about this Al Morvan got saved in the Vacation Bible School. Danny Chapman got saved in the Vacation Bible School. Uh, Francis Delahousie got saved in the, 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 the Vacation Bible School. And they all wanted me to get saved too, but I said, Lord, I didn't understand it. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't understand it today. But I do know that I'm lost, and my heart's uh, broken for it, and I'm, I'm so sorry for what I've done wrong. And I put my faith and trust in you. I believe you're as real as real can be, and I'm asking you to come into my heart and life and to save me. And I got on my face that day. I said, Lord, it's me, Richard. And I don't think I had to tell him who I was, but I said, it's me, Richard. I mean, I was down serious. I wasn't 13 years old, but I was brokenhearted, and I needed Christ, and I called on him, and he did exactly what he said he'd do. He would save my, me from my sins. He saved me, washed me white as snow, and set me on a new beginning, a new foundation in Christ Jesus, and how wonderful that has been. But yet I've met so many people that don't want that message. They don't like that message. That message goes against the grain of the soul and the, the flesh of the, of the man, mankind that walks this earth. We don't like anyone to stick their finger in our face and say we're wrong. I mean, I'm telling you, uh, Sister Tracy, when you tell Brother Paul he's wrong right now, he still don't like it. And I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm telling you, we don't like being told we're wrong. We don't ever get to that point. You know, that's what my wife says to me sometimes. She said, honey, you don't mind being right, but you can't, be, you can't stand to be wrong. 
And uh, what can I say? I don't like to be wrong, but sometimes I am. But I, I mean, I'm quick to say, honey, you're right. I am so sorry. But I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, that I've dealt with how many people today? Listen, I can't tell you, but I can say down through the uh, 49, be 50 years in April, if I live long enough this next year, be 50 years in the gospel ministry. And I can't tell you how many that have actually told me that they didn't believe that there was a God at all, at all. So first of all, those that deny that God is real, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, God help their soul. They call themselves atheists. Again, I like to call them a fool. I don't have to. God has already done that in his word. And as I share and I witness to people like that, I let them know that that's exactly what Matthew chapter 5 and 22 says. That they are, I mean, God himself calls you already, ma'am. Already, sir. I mean, already in his word. He, he, he names you. And he didn't call you Bill or, or, or Jackson or, or Stuart or Lucy or, or Charmaine. Or, I mean, he didn't call your name, but it says here, it's personal. A person that says that there is no God, you are a fool in the eyes of Almighty God. Because you put yourself in a position that you do not want him. You don't want nothing to do with him. You don't want to believe he's real. And therefore, you reject the plan of salvation. And therefore, you will find yourself in hell or if not hell, or both, you will end up in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Second of all, the Bible says that those that love their sins are a fool. And I'm telling you, Australia is no different than any other country. It is literally full of people that literally, honestly, truly, they love their sins. And when you confront them about it, I mean, I don't know how many times I've confronted people like that. And every time, without fail, they said, well, I just, I just don't care. I don't care if it's wrong or not. I'm doing it. I don't care if it's wrong. And the Bible is very clear that there is pleasure in sin, but only for a season. And uh, I tell you, you it, that's just the way it is. It, 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 to say that there's no, there's no joy in going out and do those, doing those things, you can have a good time doing those things. But I'm telling you, it's contrary to the Word of God. God hates it. It's contrary to a person that's saved by the grace of God. We have so many people that claim to be saved today, and they're right back out in the world up to their eyeballs. There's no conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. They love it. And I'm telling you one thing, the Bible says that they are not His. According to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 8, if you say you're His, you're his and you're living in adultery or you're going out and getting drunk every Friday, Saturday night, you're with the wrong crowd, you're running out there, the Bible lets you know very quickly. That is not the walk and the life of a born-again believer. You may uh, backslide, as we say. I don't like to preach on backsliding. I just don't like it at all. Seems to give people a, an excuse to go out and do a, do a few things wrong and then jump back on the other side of the track. But I say to you that according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 8, you receive chastisement. If not, your bastards are not son. Jump up to verse 6, and I'm telling you one thing. He chasteneth those B times over and over. If you're his, the Lord is going to correct you. Dad, I'm telling you, he worked us over. I'm telling you, my dad, if the welfare department in America was, and my dad was trying to raise us today, well, that'd take us kids away from my daddy. My daddy, he worked us over. He believed that scripture by the blueness of the wombs. You develop, you, you uh, uh, what do you call, uh, deliver their soul from hell. My daddy, I'm telling you, but Ted's not in, he's not in prison. He's not in hell. And I'm not either. And all of our family trusted Christ as our savior. And correction was good. I think you can go overboard. But uh, I'm telling you one thing, God, through his son and the spirit of the Lord and God's word lets us know that if you're his, he is going to correct you. That's no ifs, ands, or buts. You cannot live as a child of God in the ways of sin. Expect God not to come down on you. He will. The truth of the matter is you're saved by the grace of God. You will then. Again, it's process. Sanctification is a process. Justification is right now. When you get saved, he forgives you. He, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are his child. All right, but from that day forward, it needs to be about you growing in the Lord and holiness and righteousness and godliness. And when you step out of line, ladies and gentlemen, you go back out there in the world, you can believe that, the, I mean, when we done the wrong thing, what did, what did dad do, Ted? Beat the devil out of us if he found out about it, I'm telling you. My daddy was, all the rest of them, man, they played golf. You know, they went fishing, you know. A lot of daddies did a lot of things. My daddy, he just worked on us. That was his extracurriculum activity. But uh, anyway, I'm just saying the Lord, he, he, doesn't wanna, he doesn't wanna work on us. He didn't wanna have to be uh, 
uh, you know, the taskmaster just goes to beating on you. But I'm telling you, he will not allow you to live in sin once you're saved by the grace of God without chastisement. And if you, if you find yourself living, claiming to be saved, and you find yourself living like that, and there's no chastisement of God, no correction, Spirit of God's not dwelling with your conscience and with your mind and your heart, you can know that you're not his. You are not his. Don't keep kidding yourself. So that's a good test. That's a good litmus test. But those that, according to Proverbs 14, 9, it says that, uh, that fools laugh at sin. Fools laugh at sin. I've had one man in my lifetime, and I'll, I'll say this in passing and finish up later, but I had one man to, to my face literally laugh. I mean, listen, I laid it out there before him. He was 75 years old. His name was Shorty Hunter, and I mean, listen, he literally laughed at sin. I say to you, according to 2 Peter chapter 2, read down through about verse 14, it says that the lost person, person is without the Lord, they cannot help but sin. They keep sinning. They just keep right on. They don't want to do it a lot of times. But I'm telling you, without the Spirit of God and a new birth, unless you've been saved by the grace of God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, you have, you have a carnal nature. You're, you're not of God. And so, therefore, you, you love those things of this world. You, again, uh, like our Sunday school text that was here, the, the, uh, the lady in our text, the fast lady, the sinner, the, the prostitute on the street, but even she knew it was wrong. You know, but she needed help, and the only one who could change her life was the Lord Jesus Christ. But I've talked to many of these people that say to me that uh, they love their sins. They, they, they like it. You know, I'm going out again. I went out this week, and I did this, and I did this, and I, I know it's wrong, but I don't care. I like it. I love it. And I don't care if I die and go to hell. That is just a, 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 a piece of speech, and it's something that people say just to try to cover up and make an excuse for themselves. But deep down in their heart, let me tell you one thing, no one really wants to go to hell. You mark that down. James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth, uh, it bringeth forth what? It bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. And so when you play with sin, ladies and gentlemen, you mark it down, you're going to get burned. You're going to get burned every time. You may enjoy it for a short time, but the end of it is going to bring you to death and you'll be unprepared to meet the Lord if you're not saved by the grace of God. If you do it as a child of God over and over, the Lord will take you out of here. They will, he will take you out of here. He doesn't want to cut your life short. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if you're his, he's going to correct you. Now, uh, you talk about it. Uh, I don't care who I've talked to about it over the years. They make fun of it and they laugh. But I'm telling you one thing, when they laugh, they are nothing more than fools because they're laughing not at Richard Miller and not the message that I'm giving them. They're laughing at the word of God. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. And when they say they don't care, they don't care. Romans 6.23 said, For the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And I tell you, without Christ, you're going to perish. And when you perish, there's no second chance. You'll die and go to hell. You're in that holding pattern until Jesus comes back. The, after the seven years of tribulation period, then comes the, the resurrection of the doomed and the damned. And I'm telling you, not one person that went to hell is going to get another chance. And then he's going to say, you that are on the left hand, uh, depart from you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. He's going to cast you into the lake of fire, and that is the second death. And there is no way out. There is no coming back. There is no way to change the, your, your destiny at all. So when you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, God says, hey, that crowd that loves their sin, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. And I know a little bit about it. I'm glad I got saved when I was 13 years old. But when I was 15 years old, we had neighbor boys named the Hunter, Hunter boys, Carl and Norman Hunter. Their mom and dad was not saved. Their mom and dad left this world without the Lord. I hate them. We love them. And, but... Lou Hunter and Carl Hunter, they went out of here without the Lord. We used to play with them boys all the time. We swapped ba baseball cards and football cards. We have these little cards, you know, you know, famous players and all this. And we used to do all that type of stuff. We got 15 a little bit bigger. And I went over there one day and they were playing poker. They were playing cards. And I didn't know much about that. But anyway, they showed me how to play. And so I got in there. And so we played, I don't know, for about a week or two. And then they wanted to start playing for pennies. And so pennies, we said a little one cent piece. You don't even have the one cent piece here anymore, do you? Yeah. But anyway, we still have it in America. And so it's called pennies. And so, man, I got my few pennies and nickels. And we, I went over there and I started playing. And uh, I got to say when I was 13, 
But when you when you're 15 years old, you're just young. You don't think a whole lot about it. I didn't. I, I didn't think it was. I mean, we just playing cards, having a good time. And uh, but anyway, then I had to go and get rolls. You know, the 50 pennies in a 50 cent uh, a roll of pennies. And so I got me some rolls because I was losing more and I was taking in. And but anyway, I tell you, we played poker for about three and a half, four months. And I got to where I didn't want to go to school. I got where literally. I'm telling you, folks, I got where I didn't want to eat. I was hungry, but I didn't want to leave the game. And I'd say, bring me a sandwich. And I'd get me a sandwich brought to me across the, over at the Hunters. We was on the front porch. And I didn't, I didn't want to go home. I'm telling you, all I wanted to do when school was over, all I wanted to do, I'm telling you, within three or four months, I had literally got sucked into it. I was having a ball. I was losing a few pennies, but I was having a good time. And I could not break that thing. I just couldn't. And my dad saw it, and Mr. Hunter saw it. And one day they came over and they said, why don't you let us fellas play a little bit? They said, if you got any money, come on. What we told them. My dad said, yeah, we got a little bit of money. So we moved to the kitchen table. And uh, sitting out there on the porch on the flat bottoms, that was a bit hard for them. So they moved to the kitchen table. We played two or three days at afternoons and into the night, you know, 7, 8 o'clock and went home. But the next time, dad says, y'all want to play Jacks are Better Progressive? What, what, what I know about Jacks are better progressive. My dad knew exactly what he was doing. And I said, I mean, what is that? He said, I'll show you. Same thing, but instead of, if you got a pair of eights and you open up and you say, I'm, I'm betting three cents on this, he said, you got to have at least a pair of Jacks or, or better, three, you know, maybe three of a kind, full house, all these different things. So I said, yeah, let's go for it. So anyway, he said, okay, but we're playing for nickels. That's five cents. And so my pennies was out. I could put five pennies in, but I had to start with five, five cents. So I put my five cents in. And they dealt the cards, and no one had jacks or better. No one had a pair of jacks or better. So I'm not trying to teach you how to play cards this morning, but I'm just letting you know how this thing will suck you in. I'm trying to let you know how this thing will suck you in. And then Dad said, okay, put 10 cents in. I said, what? He said, put 10 cents in. It doubles. All right. Now it's, you got to have queens or better. And no one had a pair of queens. He said, okay, put 20 cents in. I said, what? He said, 20 cents. And no one had queens, so then it goes to kings. No one had kings. I'm telling you, the Lord just worked. I mean, he worked that thing out. I'm not kidding you. And uh, I, uh, he said, put your 40 cents in. I said, what? Dad? He said, 40 cents. Is Jackson better progressive? Now queens, kings, now? I put, my, I put my, my 40 cents in, and then it was aces, and that didn't work. He said, all right, put your 80 cents in. I said, what? Man, my pennies and stuff was running out quick. And uh, yeah, and then so we had to start again, and they didn't. No one had jacks again. He said, "All right." He said, I "Need a dollar sixty right now, dollar sixty. And uh, I, man, I'm telling you, I put my dollar sixty in, and uh, we had to go to Queens. He said, All right. "No one had it." He said, "Put three dollars and twenty cents in." I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it was killing this this high school boy. I'm telling you. And finally, I had to drop out. I didn't have any money to. I, he said, "All right." And then it went to six dollars and twenty cents. I said, how much? He said, 620. I said, well, I don't have it. And Dad said, well, you got to bow out. I said, what do you mean bow out? I put all my money in there. He said, that's the way it is, son. And so then I lost all my money in that one hand. <laughs> but I tell you, after that, I never wanted to play again. And I'm telling you, my dad, my, my dad and Mr. Hunter knew exactly what they were doing. But I'm telling you, there was, it, I'm telling you, it was fun. I loved it. I got where I didn't want to do anything but play poker. And I tell you, you go out there on a Friday night with some girl or some boy or whatever, you get out there and you get to drinking and puking your guts out, you think you're thinking, having a ball. I'm telling you, you're not having a ball. But when you get, if you're not careful, you will get where you love sin. And sin will take you down, I'm telling you. You know, years ago, the preacher preached, you know, sin will take you farther than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. And there's a lot of truth in that message. That's exactly what sin will do. Real quickly. Thirdly. God, talking about four kinds of people God calls a fool, real quickly. Number three, those that hate God's instruction. I tell you, there's so many people that claim to be saved by the grace of God. They hate God's instruction. I was doing a study on it a while back, and I preached in New Guinea about it. But when you look at the animals in the kingdom, of, uh, in, the, in the Bible, and you go through there where God used them, just like Noah, you know, whenever he got out, he didn't do, he didn't do what God told him to do. I mean, the great fish or the whale swallowed him, you know, whatever. But all through the scriptures, there's animals. And if you look, when God told them to do something, they did it the first time. <laughs> they did it the first time without rebelling, without balking, not, I mean, they just did what God told them to do. They were right there and they did exactly what God had for them to do. And why can't that be that way for you and I today? 
And I'm telling you, we're as bullheaded as they come. That's, I'm just telling you. You know, I've learned a long time ago, it's not what I don't know that hurts me the most. It's what I know and don't do anything about. I know, I'm, I, mean, we're, I mean, I don't care. The youngest child in here, uh, except in the, in the stroller over here, but I'm telling the rest of us, they know, what's, they know right and wrong. If I look back there and say they're visiting children today, and I say, hey, Paris, why don't you just walk up here and slap this man right here in the face? Paris ain't fixing to do that. She, she knows, you know, I'm not trying to embarrass what I'm saying. She knows, look at her age, and I get, get the small one over here. I mean, I'm telling you, our youngest children, these boys, they know what to do and what not to do. It doesn't take a, a, a college or a university degree, ladies and gentlemen, to know what's right and wrong. And in our Christian walk, we're not stupid either. We know God's put it in our heart through his word, through preaching and through uh, instruction from our own parents and whatever, at school, whatever. But we know what's right and we know what's wrong. But I tell you, a lot of times we rebel. We are totally rebellious. I don't care you'd be a preacher, been in the gospel ministry 50 years and be just as guilty of, of rebelling against instruction from God Almighty and his word as anyone else. Proverbs 1.7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Today, most people don't fear God. I'm just telling you. You know, God says you live, you live. He says you die, you die. And still, we know this is wrong, and we we'll go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. I'm just telling you. But it says fools despise wisdom and instruction. I'm telling you, God calls people that despise instruction, good instruction and correction. He calls them a fool. Can you, do, you, do you know any fools right now? Hello, hello. We don't have to look too far. We don't have to look next door. We don't have to look down in the next chair. We, you know what I'm saying, Brother Gadeen, We Things that used to bother us and used to entice us and, and cause us to desire things and want to do, a lot of that's just not there, but there's still other things. I don't care. You never get to the point where you don't want to do something wrong. I'm telling you, it's a battle constantly in our lives uh, as born-again born believers. But uh, we know to pray, we know to study, we know to be faithful in the house of God. We know it's right to give our tithes and offerings. We know to take our tithes and offerings and use it for something else or cut God short in our giving. We know that stealing. We wouldn't think about going down to Big W and loading up our purse or loading up our pockets and walking out of there because that's stealing. We're not that kind of people, but we'll come to the house of God every Sunday. And though we, we took home a week pay, a week's pay of 400 or 500 or $800 or so, We'll come in and throw 10 bucks in and we take, we walk in, in here. We have God's money, but we don't, cho we don't choose to put it where it belongs or the amount. And we rob God. We do it. I mean, we just do it. That's the way we are. So four kinds of people. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. When we rob God, when we do the wrong things, we go against God's instruction and his teachings. I mean, we're playing with fire. Do you hear me? We're playing with fire. I've learned a long time ago. I don't care who you are. Fire burns. It just burns. I mean, it burns. And uh, you play with fire, you get burned. You just do. Eventually, you will get burned. And so uh, this, this guy in our text here, he got burned. You understand what I'm saying? He got burned big time. Matter of fact, all these years, according to what I understand, the fool, this rich man, died and went to hell. And he's been burning in hell all of this time because he was a foolish man. So here today, we find a man that was totally foolish. He got some good instruction. Uh, you know, he knew better, he, he, but, but he, wasn't, he wasn't thinking about God. He was thinking about himself. And that's a big problem today in most people's lives. We're really not interested. I'm talking about Christians. Really, even the Christian people, for most of them, we're not interested in what God wants because he says for us to take the gospel everywhere. You don't have to go to Africa and South America and China with the gospel. God doesn't expect every one of us to go, but he expects you to go to everyone, to go around in your own daily life, at work, at play, in shopping centers, wherever you might go on the ball field. I mean, he expects us to be sharing his word. We know where to take the scripture. We know what we're supposed to do. We know where to read and study. I mean, 2 Timothy 2.15, study, show thyself, approved unto God, a work with need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of God. We know what we're supposed to be doing he said man pray without ceasing that didn't mean 24 hours a day walking around and you know they're just sitting here praying you got to go to work but in a, in a matter of prayer as you're, as you're going through life you're thinking about it and you have people on your heart and you have situations and whatever and you're praying but uh, you know we know we honestly truly know uh, 
But again, we, uh, we don't like good instruction. We really don't. And uh, godly instruction, why? Because godly instruction, it attacks our sin. We don't like it. Again, I would say, I don't have a problem. I can see my wife's problems, but I can't see my own. I don't know what it is about it. Uh, I've got good glasses, and I can see her problems and her mistakes and her faults and her weaknesses, but I can't see my own. But thank goodness, she lets me know pretty quick. Uh, Miss Naomi doesn't have a problem. I'm telling you, she will let me know quick. But anyway, uh, our source of instruction, ladies and gentlemen, is God's Word. And when we hate the good godly instruction, according to the Scriptures, ladies and gentlemen, hey, we're playing with fire. God says we're a fool, a fool, ladies and gentlemen. Fourthly, real quickly, another fool is one who what? Who dies and leaves this world unprepared to face God in eternity after they've heard the gospel. A person that leaves this world after they had an opportunity to be saved by the grace of God and did not, I mean, procrastinated, turn their back, push, shove, said, I don't want anything to do with it. In our text, ladies and gentlemen, here, we find a rich farmer. Again, I'm telling you, he, you know, he's probably worth, back in those days, he might have been worth a, a million dollars. Who knows? A million dollars back then would have been big, big money. It's not much today. You buy one house and you need $1.5 million a lot of times around here just for a, you know, just for a two-acre plot in a house. It's a Queenslander, you know, and you look at what they're asking for and you're going, whoa! But I know one thing, this guy wasn't broke. He, the Bible called him rich. Uh, verse 16 and 17 said he was a rich farmer. So I believe that to be so. He was a rich farmer. And uh, uh, in his greed, he thought, man, I'm doing well. I'm a high shot. I'm a big guy. I've got money. I'm doing fine. Matter of fact, I got so much. I, I mean, I got, my barns are full. I don't have room to put it all. I'm going to tear those barns down. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going, he said, he said to himself, you ever do that? I talk to myself all the time. Hey, self, you want to go here? Hey, self, you want to do this? Hey, self, I'm going to do that. And self said, no, don't do that, man. That's wrong. We're going to be in a mess if you do that. And I said, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And then I go ahead and do it. And then self said, see, I told you. Now look at you. No. The Bible said that he says that he spoke to himself, you know. And we do that sometimes. I mean, we, we kind of, you know, we're not, but we do. We, we, we talk to our own selves. I, I see people talking to themselves all the time, too. But he spoke to himself, and he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I got all this here, and I don't have enough room, and I, I'm going to tear down a barn. I'm going to put me up some new ones. They're going to be bigger and greater. I'm going to sit back, and I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. I don't know if he's talking about drinking Fanta and Coke or Sprite or, you know, or I don't know. Maybe he's talking about liquor. I don't know. But he says he's going to eat, he's going to drink, and he's going to be merry. And uh, he didn't even consider what God wanted in his life. And you know what? We do the very same thing. We get up day after day after day, and we don't even ask God what he wants today. We're busy. I mean, how many of us are saved by the grace of God? I told somebody the other day, he said, man, I said, Brother Miller, I said, man, I, I see you you're flat out. I said, I'm telling you, I'm flat out, man. I mean, I've been so busy with the Lord, I had not been able to talk to him the last three weeks. And of course, I was just joking. But sometimes it gets almost that way. I mean, you can be so busy that you, you're too busy. You're too busy. And uh, so a person that, you, that has heard the gospel and has an opportunity to be saved by the grace of God and goes through life and procrastinates. Let me just say real quickly in closing. In October, on October 26th, okay, that's a month and a half ago, or not quite. I guess about a month and a half ago. I buried a, a gentleman, well, I actually, two and a half months ago, I buried him. But I buried his wife a year and a month before that. I buried uh, Vivian Baxter. She was 94 years old. I'm telling you, I did everything that I knew to do from the time that lady was 65 years old and over. Every time I got off the mission field, I stayed at their house as much as I could. I carried recorded uh, CDs over there. I carried anything that I could, you know, where I preached, where others preached. I'd sit and talk to them, times I'm 30, 40, sometimes an hour. I mean, said, so whatever you do, Vivian, whatever you do, Tito, don't you two leave here without the Lord. Vivian was raised up in California. She, she had no desire for the things of the Lord. And Tito, he was raised in Argentina, a Tina man, and he was raised up in Catholicism, and he had no clue. And uh, he'd sit there though, with tears running down his face, and, I, and she would do the same thing. And I said, whatever you do, when I leave here, I'm telling you, you can get on your face right now, or you can sit right there in that, that recliner there where she had one of these lift chairs. She couldn't hardly get up. But I said, I'm telling you, you both can call on the Lord. But as far as I know, I buried both of those people without the Lord. They both died as fools. My friends, people I loved, and I'm telling you, 
some days I still think about it, I still cry. That's just, you know, a year and a half ago, a year, uh, three months, two months ago for Vivian, and now only three months, two and a half months for Tito. And I can't do a thing for them. But I'm telling you, and they were good people. They weren't stupid, you say? I'm telling you, they were very stupid. They were stupid and foolish not to trust Christ as their very own personal Savior. I want to say this and I close. True, true story. Not that I've been lying up to now. But this is a, a story that actually involved me. When I got ready to go to Bishop two years ago, ladies and gentlemen, almost 40, 45 years ago, I sold my home. Well, our home. My first wife's gone now, but we sold the house and we took off the new game. And it was going to go to the new game. When I sold the house, I needed, there was about three months in the time we sold the house that we was actually leaving. And if you go down and try to rent a flat or a house or something for a, a three months, no one wants you in there. You understand that? They, they want you at least six months, a year, whatever. And so no one was willing to rent. Finally, I found a, a, a lake house over on a lake called Lake Irving. And I went down and looked at a Shorty Hunter. I mentioned him at the beginning of the message. I mentioned him closely. And uh, Shorty, was a, he was a, a nice guy. Uh, he was 75 years old. He was full wit. Uh, you could have a laugh at him, but he had... I'm honest, he had the outside of Bob Bellway's house at Czechoslovakia that I met in Baroka up in the Highlands of Papua New Guinea. He was head of the workshop there for the public works. But I'm telling you, those two men had the most foulest mouth I've ever heard in my life. And uh, it was terrible. I just hated to be around a person like that. But I did my best to win short amount of award. And uh, I talked to him, and I said, Get ready to go. I've been there two and a half, almost three months, and I told him we're going to be leaving, and he understood that. And I said, Shorty, whatever you do, and I've been with you to him, I said, Shorty, whatever you do, don't you leave this door without the Lord. He said, you hear me and hear me well, Richard. I'm 75 years old, and he said, I'm a horse's butt. Let's get real this morning. And he said, I'm going to tell you, he said, I, I believe I could leave here, and he was walking distance. A state by Baptist church. He said, I believe I could go up there and start sitting on those benches and hear the word of God preached. And I believe that I could come to the point that I believe I could call upon the Lord and ask him to save me, and I believe he would. But he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, not me. He said, I'm not, I don't deserve to go to hell to heaven. I deserve to go to hell and I'm going there. And he said, nothing you can do will ever change my mind. I said, sure you don't say that. Don't you dare say that, sir. You're not. Listen, come to your senses, sir. You're 75 years old. You're not a small boy. You're not stupid. Your time's running out. Man, I worked with him and worked with him. He said, no. The week that I got ready to go, I went over there and talked to him again. And he said, you know, I told, I told Evelyn, that's his wife. I said, I told Evelyn this morning. I said, you know, I don't know where that young preacher's going to be when I die. What I got? Four, five, six, eight years more? Who knows? But if he's home back in America when I die, I want him to preach my funeral. You check around and see if he's back home. And he said, Preacher, will you do that? I said, well, I'm here, I would. And he said, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do. He said, I want you to preach me into hell as hot as you've ever preached in tonight. I'm telling you, don't you cut me any slack. I want you to stand here and say, you're right, right here today lies in the state, the body and remains of Shorty H. Hunt. From Lake Early, Arkansas. Out of Taylor, Arkansas, who lays his remains, but right now his soul is in hell. He said, I want you to tell them what I've told you. And I want you to tell them today that Shorty said that I'm in hell. My body's here, but my soul's already perished in hell. There's no way back. I've made the biggest mistake that any man, woman, boy, or girl could ever make. But he said, I tell you, you let them know that I told you to preach me into hell as hard as any man you've ever preached. Any person you've ever preached in hell, you let them know. And I'm telling you, for the next 35, 40 minutes, I preached it as hard as I could. I preached it in hell, ladies and gentlemen. I did exactly what that man told me to do. And I said, I'm just telling you, folks, you can look at me and think, oh, how awful, how awful. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, you take the awfulness away, you can make it, you can shake it, you can bake it, you can do what you want to. But I'm telling you, any of you sitting right here, without Christ Jesus and the last, you pull the last breath through the winter, through your nostrils, you're going to face God and you do. Without Christ, you're going right where Shorty Hunter just told me to tell you not to. I'm telling you, folks, there's four kinds of people in the Bible that God called the fool. I'm telling you one thing. Shorty Hunter was one. Vivian Baxter and 
he go back to those two others and they can just one. If you're here today and you've never been saved by the grace of God, nothing else matters for you. You better know that you know that you know that you're saved by the grace of God. The Bible said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm telling you, if the word of God does the word of God in your heart, and the spirit of God is drawing you and showing you you've got a broken contract heart, you call upon the Lord of God, and he will save you. Let's die for prayer. All right, take your songbooks, would you? We're just going to sing a song before we go. 229, 229. I like this song, Wonderful Peace. Of course, when you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have that peace that passes all understanding. Let's stand if you're able, stretch the legs a little bit. And I just want to say this, if you don't know the Lord as your Saviour, it's not hard to get saved preacher said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved we don't know your heart but uh, if you know this morning that you're not after the service come and see me or brother Miller or one of our men or ladies and we'd be happy to take the Bible and show you how you can be saved let's stand shall we let's sing this song wonderful peace we'll just sing a few verses of these verse number one are you ready one two three Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight Rose a melody sweeter than some In celestial-like strains it unceasingly falls O oh, my soul like an infinite calm Peace, peace, wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Verse 4, and I think when I rise to that city of peace, where the author of peace I shall see. That one strain of the song which the ransom will sing In the heavenly kingdom shall be Peace, peace, wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above Sweep over my spirit forever in fathomless billows of love. Ah, soul, are you here without comfort and rest? Make Jesus your friend ere the shadows grow dark. Oh, accept this sweet peace so sublime. Peace, peace, wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray In fathomless billows of love Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today Lord, it's good to be with the brethren and just to sing and, Lord, just to worship you a little bit and hear the preaching and the teaching of your word. Pray, God, that the message that we heard this morning would resonate in our hearts and we ask, Holy sure. Spirit, that you would keep speaking to our hearts and use us for the glory of our God. Lord, some of us will be back tonight and others won't be. They'll go about their duties, whatever it is that they have. I pray as we go about our duties, we go about our days, I pray, God, that we would go understanding that we come across the path of people every day that don't know this wonderful peace. Right. And I pray, God, that you would use us to speak the word of God. And I know that there are people that reject it, 
They're not going to listen to it, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop sharing it. And so, God, I pray that you'd send us forth with your blessing. Thank you for each and every one that's here, has been here today. Lord, I pray that they've received a blessing from you. And we thank and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you again. Thank you if you're visiting with us. And trust you had a good time. God bless as you go your way. Yeah, that'll go.